Is God real? Is Christianity the way to salvation? Does the Bible speak profound truth? There's a lot of debate to be had over these questions. One thing that we know is that the Bible makes many attempts to predict the future. And whether you believe in God or not, there's no denying that more of those predictions than you might think have actually come to pass. These are 20 Bible prophecies that ended up coming true. Number 20. The Failed Siege of Jerusalem During the Judahite revolts against Babylon, the Siege of Jerusalem between around 589 to 587 BC would be the last stand. This was when the king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar II, had besieged the city of Jerusalem, which was the capital city of the Kingdom of Judah at that time. The city was besieged for 30 months, and then Jerusalem fell, and the Babylonians apparently destroyed that and the Temple of Solomon as well. The Kingdom of Judah was dissolved and many of the people were then exiled to Babylon, and like many of the historical events of this particular era, the exact dates are often unclear. This is because it was a really long time ago, and most of the resources for events are religious documents, which have their own agendas and stories to tell, and dating things with 100% accuracy is very tricky indeed. In the instance of the Siege of Jerusalem, there are archaeological findings to support the account that Jerusalem was destroyed in either 587 or 586 BC, and historians have cross-examined the written evidence from the Bible and the Neo-Babylonian sources, and have discovered that accounts correspond with 587 BC as the end date for the siege. According to the prophets, this was predicted in the Bible, but realistically, it was a time of great empires, so violent crushing of peoples and their cities was kind of commonplace, and the city of Jerusalem was, like many other large centers of the time, a prime target for any invading force. It was not the only city to be destroyed, and it was the main hub of the Kingdom of Judah, which was under attack all the time during that era. Now it's time for the sweet topic. The weird thing about the Bible is it requires a lot more interpretation than many people realize. It's not only a list of straight facts that the reader can just trust verbatim. Due to the nature of translation, localization, and passing of time, it's been interpreted many different ways all throughout history. And some things that are said in some versions are not in others. There are some that claim apocalyptic weather as a sign of dark times ahead is inevitable and coming soon, so when the Muslim holy place in Saudi Arabia unexpectedly froze over for a short while during a sudden and intense winter that was not scientifically foreseen, many cited it as an example of a passage coming to pass. But what do you think? Biblical prophecy in action or just a cold snap? As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below using the hashtag Sweet Topic. Number 19. The Fall of Jerusalem According to texts that allege to record the words of Jesus Christ that were written decades after his death, Jesus predicted his own life and death down to the smallest detail. Although there are no texts that contain the words of Christ that were written during his lifetime, nor were any transcribed from the words as he spoke them, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the Book of Acts of the Apostles, claim to hold the words of Christ within their pages. There are historical documents that come from around 70 AD to support the history that Jerusalem was destroyed during that year, the assault on the city, this time being led by the Romans. The prophecy is said to have been made by Jesus in the words as recorded in Matthew and Luke. This is interesting because it's widely believed by scholars that these texts were not written until about 85 CE and later, and probably between 85 and 95 CE. So it seems that calling it a prophecy when it had already happened, well that might be just a little bit of a stretch. There's nothing to see here, just some psychological gymnastics being performed by apologetics. Number 18. Destruction of Tyre Now, if all of your information about Bible prophecies and the truth, or not, of their fulfillment comes from the Bible, people on Bible websites, you're likely to get a huge amount of stuff that would prove the truth of the big book and all the scriptures within. With that being said, we'll have a look at another one of the prophecies that is used to prove the truth of the Bible. The destruction of Tyre is a biblical prophecy that's found in several books of the Old Testament, but it's mostly referred to in the books of Ezekiel and Isaiah. This prophecy foretells the destruction of the ancient city of Tyre. This was a then Phoenician city-state that's located in what is now known as Lebanon. So far, so regular. 
In Ezekiel 26, 1 through 14, the prophecy describes how the city was going to be besieged by many nations, saying that its walls would be broken down and its towers demolished, and rather dramatically, all of its stones, timber, and soil would then be thrown into the sea. It also predicts that the city would become a place for spreading fishing nets and would never be rebuilt. Historically, it was indeed besieged and destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II around 585 BC, fulfilling much of the prophecy. But then again, so were pretty much all the other major cities across that region at some point during various empirical reigns. Wars were an extremely common occurrence, and the destruction of cities was part of those warring times. And then there's the slightly problematic fact that the city was later rebuilt on an adjacent island and continued to exist as a major trading hub in the region. This led some to interpreting the prophecy as having a dual fulfillment, with the ultimate destruction of the city being fulfilled in a more metaphorical sense. Because if it doesn't do it exactly as it says, then you can use metaphor, but this makes things difficult to argue when you want to take other parts of the Bible completely literally. You know, like the creation story. Number 17. Israel Restored After years of conflict and negotiations, Jewish leaders declared the creation of the new nation-state of Israel in 1948. However, this decision would be met with opposition from many Palestinians and neighboring Arab countries. The United Nations had proposed a plan to partition the land into separate Jewish and Arab states, but not all parties agreed on this arrangement and the declaration of Israel would then lead to a war between the newly formed nation and its Arab neighbors. The conflict resulted in widespread violence and displacement for both Jewish and Palestinian communities, and for some people, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy, that of the restoration of Israel. For others, it's a devastating and ongoing battle for the right to live in lands that belong to many different people. Number 16. The Secession of Empires in the Bible, there's a prophecy by Daniel about the secession of empires. He goes on about a series of powerful kingdoms that will rise and fall over time, and it's described in a way that sees these kingdoms as different parts of a statue made of different materials. The first kingdom is represented by a head of gold, said to symbolize the Babylonian Empire, which was very strong and powerful at the time that Daniel lived. Then the next bit of the statue is a chest and arms that are made out of silver. This bit is supposed to represent the Persian Empire, which had conquered Babylon. Next comes the belly and thighs, the parts that are said to be made of bronze, and are meant to be the Greek Empire, which followed the Persian Empire and was led by Alexander the Great. After that, there are legs made of iron, believed to represent the Roman Empire, and finally, there are feet that are partly made of iron and partly of clay, which are alleged to symbolize a divided kingdom or a time of fragmentation and weakness. According to the prophecy, these kingdoms will come and go, but in the end it will be the kingdom of God that will emerge and last forever. This is interpreted differently by different groups, and it's seen as a message about the rise and fall of earthly powers, and then the eventual victory of God's kingdom. Any examination of the history of this era would recognize that this is not a dreadfully difficult prediction to make. Not only were empires and wars and such a pretty significant part of life back then, but there's also an inevitability of the overthrow of nations and empires, and history has proven this time and again. If you choose to interpret this as a fulfillment of a prophecy, then that's a personal choice. In historical terms, there have been multiple empires that have been and gone since the last of those alleged in the statue metaphor, and it's just the way that history works. Number 15. The Fall of Nineveh Next up, we have a biblical prophecy about the fall of the ancient city of Nineveh. This particular prophecy predicts that Nineveh, which was powerful and important at the time, would be destroyed because of its wickedness. This, however, was a kind of common sort of prediction. Wickedness basically meant not conducting oneself in the exact interpretation of the scriptures that were popular of the time. A whole bunch of places were accused of this crime and were therefore condemned to be destroyed. But how many of the great cities of the era survived forever? That is really the question. And were they all being struck down for their wickedness? That can be definitely argued about any place at any time, so this is why these sort of prophecies are easy to prove. This prophecy comes from the prophet Nahum, when he talks about how the city will be attacked by enemies and that it will fall into ruins. He describes the destruction in vivid detail, saying that the city will be flooded and its people will flee in fear. Historically, this prophecy did come true. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, but it was eventually conquered by a coalition of enemies. The city was destroyed, and it never regained former glory. But how different was this from 
Many other places that suffered a similar fate and were never named in a prophecy, though. Number 14. The Birth of Jesus from a Virgin Next up, we have a prophecy that lies at the heart of Christian belief, but somewhat controversially, there's a tiny little discussion among scholars about this being a bit of a translation issue. And when you go this far down a specific road, it's quite difficult to admit that you may have taken a wrong turn a few thousand years back, and the central message of one of your stories could actually be a typo. The idea that Mary was a virgin is extremely important in the mythology of Christianity. The text has been interpreted to say virgin, but there are plenty amounts of evidence that shows that the closer translation of the original text would be the word maiden. Historically, this is a tricky word, but back when it was originally written, the text being original Greek, the word maiden simply meant young woman. It did not actually refer to her status as a virgin or not being a virgin. Anyways, this is a side note really, but a fascinating example of translations and historic interpretations having a huge impact on the way that people have understood the Bible and determined its meanings all throughout history. Number 13. Isaiah 19 Prophecy Now we have a prophecy in Isaiah 19 in the Old Testament. This essentially is the oracle that speaks against the nations of the earth. In this, Isaiah the prophet warns that the people should not put their faith in foreign nations nor in any other gods. He says that they should trust only God alone for their salvation, and that when the Lord arrives in Egypt, their gods and other worship will be exposed as idols. It says that God will bring judgment on the nation of Egypt and it will fall. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that heavy and dense bit of scripture, but the essence of this is that although Egypt as an empire seemed immovable during biblical times and they thought that it would last forever, it did eventually fall and this was interpreted by some as a prophecy being fulfilled. Number 12. The Rise of Muhammad According to Muslim tradition, even though Muhammad is not explicitly named in the Bible, some verses have been interpreted as foretelling the rise of a prophet. In Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, it says that a prophet will be raised from amongst the people, and this is understood by some Muslims to refer to a descendant of Ishmael, who is believed to be the ancestor of the Arab people. In Deuteronomy 33.2, there's part of a scripture that's about the shining forth of God from Sinai, Ser, and Mount Paran, and this is interpreted by Muslims as symbolizing the advent of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, respectively. Number 11. RFID Chips and the EU Now, it's a pretty good idea to remember that the Book of Revelation is a kind of terrifying nightmare vision that's unlike the rest of the Bible, and actually does not have the same sort of historical credentials as some of the other books. In fact, even though it's attributed to John, this is not the John of other biblical areas, and nobody really knows quite who this particular John actually was. Revelation is completely bananas, so there's that. Despite that fact, there are some Christians who apparently believe that the book of Revelation in the Bible predicts things that will happen in the future, and they think that certain parts of it describe our modern world as it is today. One of the things that they have decided is that a mark that is mentioned in chapter 13 is something like a barcode or a tiny chip that could be implanted in people's hands and foreheads. This mark may be used to control what people can buy and sell, and this, they say, can be recognized in modern stuff like RFID, which stands for Radio Frequency Identification. It's a technology which uses radio waves to identify and track objects, and these are made into small tags containing microchips that store information. These can be attached to or even embedded in different items, and in Revelation, this so-called mark is used to control people. Another part of Revelation talks about people from all over the world being able to see certain events happening at the same time, and some Christians believe this could be a hint at modern communication technology, like live news broadcasts that reach people everywhere. And as if that wasn't insane enough, there's also a belief among some that a powerful ruler known as the Beast will come from a European group of countries, possibly even bigger than ancient Rome, and they often see this as a reference to the European Union. I mean, bureaucrats are quite evil, but I don't know if they qualify as beast material. Number 10. Snake in the Western Wall As enticing as yet another so-called biblical prophecy might be to some, there's nothing staggeringly unusual about the idea of snakes appearing. Well, anywhere in the Holy Land. This entire desert area is essentially stuffed full of snakes, both deadly and not so deadly, 
So again, a prophecy about a snake is also a little bit of a cop-out. But here we are back in 2018, when someone took a video at the Western Wall in Israel, and those old tabloid rags couldn't help themselves but to declare that it was a prophecy about the second coming being made real. Except that this is not a specific sort of prophecy. It's just that in the Bible, snakes are generally maligned and seen as representing all of the evil in the world, and apparently, to some more exuberant imaginations, the ending of the world. But this was almost six years ago, and although it may have felt like a bunch of biblical junk has been raining down on us, if you are that way inclined, there has not really been any kind of time in history when there hasn't been signs of an impending apocalypse. I mean, think of the Black Death in medieval times, or maybe even all of the horrors of the Second World War, or, well, any conflict, disease, or criminal government. Yes, the world has always been ending, and a snake wiggling in a wall in a country that's full of snakes, that probably happens all the time, don't you think? Number 9. The Messiah Will Be Born in Bethlehem As every school child ever had to put on a nativity play nose, the baby Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem. So that's cleared that one up then. This is yet another prophecy from the Old Testament that was fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. It's written in the book of Micah, and then the fulfillment is in the Gospel of Matthew. Micah was a prophet from the 8th century BC, believed to have been around at that same time as other prophets like Hosea, Amos, and Isaiah. His main prophesying goes on about the fact that God will judge Samaria and Jerusalem because of all the sin that the people in those places have been doing, like all of the other cities, ever. And then, after all the judgments done, God will give restoration. The future that Micah describes is one where the city of Bethlehem is the birthplace of a ruler who will be even greater than David, so there you go. It's facts, I'm sure. Number 8. The Messiah Will Be a Prophet Like Moses Back again with Deuteronomy, where we can see that we're looking at yet more stuff about prophets. This time, it's apparently being interpreted as an idea that the Messiah, when he comes, will be from the Israelites. The prophecy states that the people of Israel should listen to that prophet, and the book of Deuteronomy is said to be the words of Moses and what he said to the people of Israel while they were all out in the wilderness. But the alleged fulfillment of this particular prophecy is found again in the Gospels, this time in John, where the story goes that people had seen Jesus and proclaimed him to be the prophet that they had been promised from Bethlehem and the line of King David. It's backed up again in Acts, which refers to the words of Moses, who said that the Messiah would be a prophet like him and that everyone should listen to him. It's thrilling stuff. But we should all just remember that the writers of the New Testament, well, they were very familiar with the Old Testament, and they didn't pluck this stuff out of thin air. So the fact that it corresponds so closely, well, maybe that's because it's supposed to. Number 7. The Messiah Will Be Rejected By His Own People in Isaiah 53, there's a bit that says, Who has believed our message? To whom will the Lord reveal his saving power? He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we did not care. This is known as the prophecy of the suffering servant, and it's a real fun one by the way it sounds. Basically, it's saying that the people will reject their Messiah. This is demonstrated as fulfilled in John when it says, but although the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him when he came. Even in his own land and among his own people, he was not accepted. And then again, it's written in John 8 and on a bit in Matthew as well. Number 6. The Messiah Will Be Betrayed Next up, we have a Psalm of David, which is being used as a kind of prophecy by those who like to find such things in the Bible. It says, Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. This is actually supposed to be where David is talking about his own isolation and his own faith in God, where he trusts God and how sharing food unites people. These are said to be prophecies of the betrayal of Jesus by his friend, though. Number 5. For 30 Pieces of Silver After Jesus tells Judas that he is the one who will betray him, he goes to ask the priests exactly how much cash they will give him if he gives up Jesus. They say 30 pieces of silver, which echoes the words of the book of Zechariah from the Old Testament, in which the prophet talks about 30 shekels of silver. This would be the standard price for the life of a slave and is referred to as a goodly price. 
Number 4. He Will Be Silent Back again to Isaiah and the jolly reed that is the prophecy of the suffering servant. This bit of prophecy says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. From prison and trial they led him away to his death. And of course we have the fulfillment of said prophecy in the Gospels. Matthew and Mark basically say the exact same thing, as these texts often do. Actually, since they seem to have been extremely strongly influenced by one another, or one by the other, it's impossible to know who copied whose homework in this ancient scenario. Matthew 27 says, But when the leading priests and other leaders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear there are many charges against you, Pilate demanded? But Jesus said nothing, much to the governor's great surprise. So, it was written that Jesus didn't say anything when he was pulled up in front of the priests who accused him on various crimes. This is said to be because he was leaving the judgment part of things up to God, and this is a message that Jesus was really into, but seems to have been largely forgotten in a whole bunch of modern Christian habits. Number 3. He Will Die By Crucifixion in biblical times, crucifixion was a pretty common form of punishment, whereby a person was nailed or tied to a wooden cross and then left there to die. It was a very painful and humiliating way to execute someone, and that was exactly its purpose. Crucifixion was often used by the ancient Romans as a punishment for serious crimes or for people that they wanted to make an example out of. The person being crucified would suffer for hours or even days before they died, as they were unable to breathe properly and would slowly lose their strength. But crucifixion had been used by many different cultures for centuries, and it was not just the way in which Jesus was sentenced to die, although it has been forever associated with him ever since. So, the fact that a crucifixion appears to be what is being described in Psalm 22, a psalm of David, well, that's not all that unusual during that period of time. The execution in the scripture has been interpreted by the zealous to be a prophecy of the death of Jesus upon the cross. And then, in the book of Zechariah, it says, Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on all the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me, whom they have pierced, and mourn for him as for an only son. This has been widely interpreted to be the prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, as described being fulfilled in Matthew, Mark, and John. Number 2. The Messiah's Bones Will Not Be Broken here we are again where this time the alleged part of the Bible in which we're told there is a prophecy is Numbers. Now, Numbers is a completely bananas list of rules and regulations that were supposed to be followed by believers, and these included all kinds of crazy sounding sacrifices and rituals and lists. This particular bit is about the proper preparation for Passover. So the fact that this is interpreted as a prophecy, well, it's just a tiny bit weird. But anyhow, here we go. The scripture says, They must not leave any of the lamb until the next morning, and they must not break any of its bones. They must follow all the normal regulations concerning the Passover. This somehow has been seen as a prophecy of the fact that when Jesus was on the cross, it was getting kind of late in the day and the Sabbath was coming, so they needed to speed up the process and get the bodies of the crucified down a lot quicker. They broke the legs of the other victims to easily remove them, but then they saw that Jesus was already dead, so they poked him a little bit in the side with a spear, and his bones were apparently not broken. This is what was recorded in John, anyway. And then much later, Paul would write about Jesus as being the Passover lamb, having been sacrificed for everyone. And so, well, there you have it. Number 1. He Will Be Buried in a Rich Man's Tomb Oh, deep joy! Here we are back in Isaiah's suffering servant again, where this time it says, He had done no wrong and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. This is the prophecy that Jesus was to be buried in a rich man's tomb, and lo and behold, the fulfillment can be found in Matthew, where it says, As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who was one of Jesus' followers, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance as he left. And so, it was all rather excitingly described, just as it had been in the Old Testament. Well, that's all from the fun and excitement of biblical prophecies for today. Which one of these was your favorite? 
Go ahead and let me know all about it in the comments section down below. Also, be sure to check out the other cool stuff that's showing up on the screen, and I will see you next time.